Follow along there in chapter 1, verses 4 through 24. The topic, the Lord speeds to Ezekiel in Babylon, riding on his throne chariot, carried by four living creatures. The title of our message, Creature Features. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, this morning we'd like to just cast our cares upon you, knowing that you care for us. Uh, Lord, uh, that night before you were crucified, you gave your disciples a foot washing to teach them a lesson, Lord, about washing one another's feet and ministering to one another. But uh, Lord, I'd like to think that we, we still would love to have our feet washed by you. Uh, and Lord, if it's not asking too much, I pray that that would be our experience this morning, that we had been in the presence of the great servant who has shown us how to serve others. Take this word, Lord, and make it alive in our hearts the way that only you can do. We pray in Jesus' name and those who agreed said, amen. The Batmobile is just the most well-known vehicle. There are additionally the Bat Cycle, the Bat Wing, the Bat Boat, the Bat Sub, the Bat Ski, the Bat Glider, the Bat Truck, the Bat Shuttle, the Bat Trike, the Bat Copter, and the Bat Train. There may be some others as well. In fact, one of the Classic comic books has Batman coming in. He looks like he's sitting on a dining room chair with a whirly thing on top of it. Crazy stuff. There may be cooler comic rides, but the Batman obviously has the largest collection. The Lord has a sweet ride. Its wheels are mentioned 10 times in this chapter. Its rims are mentioned twice. It is conveyed by four supernatural chauffeurs called living creatures. Further on in the book, Ezekiel says, I knew they were cherubim. Uh, He knew because the cherubim were associated with the presence of God in the Holy of Holies in the temple at Jerusalem. There were carved images of them out of gold and olive wood, as well as images embroidered on the curtains, and there were wall carvings and door carvings. The nation of Judah was a vassal of Babylon at this time. No worries, they thought. God's presence was in Solomon's temple. Certainly, God would not allow Babylon to prevail. They were wrong to trust in the temple. God allowed it to be leveled and then looted. Before the temple was destroyed, God would remove his presence from there. Ezekiel was relocated to an internment camp by the river Kibar. He would be God's prophet to break the awful news to his fellow captives in Babylon that God has left the building. Aren't you glad that can't happen today? Well, hold on. Jesus did write a letter to the church in Ephesus warning them that he was about to what? Remove their lampstand if they didn't repent of their sin of leaving their first love. And so that's a point of a touch point for us in the sense that God could, I mean, our church, every church, any church that's like the Ephesians church, which was doing a lot of great things, by the way, but the Lord said, you're not doing them from the right motivation. They're not from love, and I can't have that. Uh, And so you guys need to repent. And so something for us to think about as we're going through this text. I'll organize my comments around the two subjects we encounter, the real cherubim and the real chariot. And so let's take a look at the cherubim first, starting in verse four. Angels or aliens? Well, ufologists claim that Ezekiel was an ignorant man using primitive language to describe his encounters with extraterrestrial visitors or what they like to call ancient astronauts. Ezekiel wasn't ignorant. He was God's prophet. And his language is superb. It's marvelous. He wasn't struggling at all. He said he knew that they were cherubim, not Chewbacca. And so I think we should just take him at his word. Now, Back in the 70s when I got saved, the late 70s especially, uh, Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, was super popular. uh, And the Lord really used that in a neat way. But the theory was that John the Apostle uh, saw things in the future that he couldn't understand. And so he saw cobra attack helicopters. And he looked at him and said, well, it looks like a locust. And so he talked about locusts coming out of the pit. And all, and, and you know, that was okay as far as it went, but uh, you know, they, he didn't see what he said, he knew what a locust looked like. I mean, you know what I mean? And, and these were locusts that came out like demons. He knew what demons were about too. And so uh, this stuff is, uh, exp- it's not necessarily explained, but it's, a, a, it's just the way it actually is. I mean, these, these are the things themselves. And so no ancient astronauts, 
We choose aliens over angels because mankind doesn't like to retain God in our knowledge. We'd rather believe some fantastic tale, the truth uh, that we were created by and then visited by the loving and merciful and forgiving God of the Bible. We can fight E.T. Now, he's too, you know, we don't really want to fight E.T. He's so cute, right? But uh, all the, think of all the alien movies. We're fighting the aliens, and we eventually win because of our indomitable human Captain Kirk-like spirit that proclaims never die, never surrender. If God exists, though, we need to face the fact that we are sinners in need of saving and our submission. And so this is why uh, these men who suppose themselves to be, uh, you know, smart, but they're really ignorant. They say, no, there isn't a God of the Bible. There are aliens, greys, that came and and seeded the earth, and uh, that explains nothing. Verse 4, then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it, and radiating out of its mist like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Whirlwind Ezekiel, magnitude off the charts, was bearing down on this man who would never be priest. The storm was supernatural. It was in the unseen realm made known to Ezekiel. This wasn't something everyone could see. And so verse 5, also from within it came the likeness of four creatures, living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces and each one had four wings. Their legs were straight, the soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet, they sparkled like the color of burnished bronze, the hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides, and each of the four had faces and wings. When we encounter visions like this in the Bible, we tend to immediately look for the symbolism. Uh, you, you know, we want to know what, what is this representing to us? Uh, let me give you an example. In verse 18, we're going to be told that these living creatures were full of eyes. They were full of eyes. One commentator I read said, the number of eyes, wherever they may be, speak of multidimensional awareness. Our two eyes help us to perceive a three-dimensional reality. A multitude of eyes suggests a greater awareness than we know as human. But another commentator said this, we can hide nothing from God He sees and knows everything. And so his idea is that the many eyes are a symbol that God sees into our lives. Uh, But I think you can tell just from those two examples, symbolism is subjective, right? I mean, if, if there's no definition for the symbol, then it becomes subjective. Book of Revelation, people say, oh, you can't teach that because it's full of symbols and pictures. All of them are defined for you if you just read a few verses on or they're, they're taken from the Old Testament. And, and so it's not a secret. And, and so we don't have to interpret anything in the book of the Revelation, really. We know what the, they're talking about. And so what is it that Ezekiel means when he says that they have lots of eyes? He means that they had lots of eyes. This is what they actually looked like. Uh, Another distinguishing physical trait here, I don't know if you caught it or not, but in verse 7, it says their legs were straight. They don't have knees. And so you have kneeless creatures that are filled with eyes. And we think, well, that's ridiculous. Well, so is a duck-billed platypus. And so if I were to, if you, if I were to show you a platypus and, and you'd say, well, what, what's the purpose of this bill? It's part of the duck-billed platypus. There's no purpose to it. It, it's, it's, It's a description. And so when these beings that are being described, these cherubim, this is what they look like. Now, I get lost in the description. I'm not an artist. I'm not very artistic. And so it seems, you know, weird to me. But Ezekiel said, yeah, I got a good look at them, and this is what they look like. In verse 9, it says, their wings touched one another. The creatures did not turn when they went. They each went straight forward. Cherubim appear in a few other settings associated usually with the presence of God and especially his visible presence in the tabernacle and later the temple. In the wilderness tabernacle during the Exodus, cherubim were woven into the curtains of the tabernacle. Two golden figures of the cherubim stretched their wings over the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. You've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, no doubt, right? And uh, that's what they're going for, that ark, that box is the ark, 
And then on top of it is the mercy seat, a separate piece of furniture, which is the lid. And then there are two cherubim, one on each side, facing each other with their wings touching in the middle. And so that's uh, what the ark looked like. And then God said to Moses, there I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the covenant, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. And so in essence, that place inside the Holy of Holies, atop the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, God says, I hang out here and uh, among my people and uh, minister to them. And he was, God is so infinitely holy and magnificent that only the high priest only once a year could actually go in and, and be in that presence. Uh, everyone else was left outside in various degrees of closeness. But God cons uh, consented to live among his people in the tabernacle. Then in Solomon's temple, there were four cherubim in the temple, the two gold ones on the mercy seat and two larger ones that were carved out of olive wood, foreshadowing the entire ark. The doors leading to the holy place were decorated with carvings of cherubim. Uh, and so this was a common picture to the Jews. Now notice the phrase, their wings touched one another. The cherubim in the temple were carved that way. And so Ezekiel saw the real thing that the earth was a symbol of. And so the, the cherubim here, they're not a symbol of anything. They're the real thing. What we had on earth, that was the symbol of what goes on in heaven. That place was where the presence of God visibly dwelt among his people. Did you ever think about that? I mean, there was something going on in that building. This divine presence of God is called Shekinah, the Shekinah glory, the glory of the Lord, the cloud, the fire, and a few other names. The Shekinah makes many appearances in the Hebrew scriptures. In the Exodus from Egypt, for instance, the pillar of fire in the daytime and the cloud at night were the Shekinah. When Solomon's temple was being dedicated, we read, when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest couldn't enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground and pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good, his mercy endures forever. And so at the dedication of the temple, they visibly saw this fire, this cloud, this glory of the Lord come down and fill the temple and, and indicating that his presence would be there for his people and they would approach him according to the law. God wants his creatures to dwell with him. It's not an easy thing to accomplish because we are depraved sinners and he is infinitely holy, and he cannot, um, he can't be forgiving sin without a reason, without a, a method. And so it's, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. And that's what happens when Jesus Christ comes as a man. He's born of a, of a virgin, he comes as a man, he dies for our sins, satisfying God's holiness and uh, our sinfulness, and we are able to believe Christ and be saved. And so uh, th God has been working ever since the Garden of Eden to bring mankind back into this relationship. He wants his creatures to dwell with him, and he is up to the task. The last four English words of this book declare the future time when the Lord is there. It's like the culmination of all the things we read from Genesis until Revelation the Lord is there with us. Now, as we journey through Ezekiel and the temples, we're going to see that the Lord was there in the first temple. Then he wasn't there. He's still not there because they don't even have a temple, but he will be there in the future. He will return. Verse 10, as for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side. Each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side. And each of the four had the face of of an eagle. They were like the mayor of Halloween Town in the nightmare before Christmas. Yeah, you don't want to admit you saw that, do you? But I don't know. I just, I, I've heard this as a rumor. But anyway, 
No, he's a little mayor, and he's got a smile on one face, and then his head turns around, and he's frowning. Only these guys had four heads like that. And I, I, you know, this is it's kind of losing me, as I said earlier in the description. And we think, ew, but, um, you know, these are terrible in the way we used to use that word, that they are awesome and awe-inspiring, and, you know, there's, just, there's also obviously something beautiful about them uh, as they convey the Lord where he's going. Now, weird as all this is, these four faces, a Jew would recognize those four faces. They are lifted from Jewish history. In the book of Numbers, God told the nation of Israel how they were to set up their camp around the tabernacle in the wilderness and where they would put their tribal ensigns. Each of the four sides, north, south, east, and west, was to be encamped by three tribes, four to the north, four to the south, four to the east, four to the west, The tribes of Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun were camped on the east. They were collectively called the camp of Judah. The symbol on the ensign of Judah, what do you think it was? A lion, because of the lion of the tribe of Judah. The tribes of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin were on the west. Their symbol was an ox. The tribe of Reuben, Simeon, and Gad, they were on the south, and their symbol was a man. And the tribes of Dan, Naphtali, and Asher were on the north, and they were collectively called the camp of Dan, and the symbol on their ensign was an eagle. And so those four uh, images uh, were very familiar to Jews. And what God is telling him is that in heaven, I am surrounded by cherubim in my glory, and I gave you a picture of that in the way that you camp on the earth. And so what what happens in the tabernacle and the temple, that is a representation of what's going on in heaven. Heaven is the real, the the symbol is on the earth. Uh, Chuck Missler points out that if you uh, take these tribes and the way they're encamped, north, south, east, and west, only going straight back, not in a curve. They'd be like if we blew out the back wall and kept going straight back with these two, you know, so they're north, south, east, and west. and you, their numbers are given, there, there's a count for how many uh, are in each tribe. And if you put you know, little representative uh, tents and tried to show how many were on each side, and you look from above, from a mountain perspective, what, do you th- what shape do you think that it would form? It sh- formed the shape of a cross. Uh, and, and so you know, the Lord everywhere in scripture has these neat little kind of nuggets for us to discover. In verse 11, it says, thus were their faces, their wings stretched upward, two wings of each one touched one another, and two covered their bodies. In addition to Ezekiel's description, Isaiah, Daniel, and the apostle John described them from their own experiences. There are slight differences in each, but that's to be expected. No contradictions, just different emphases that can easily be reconciled. Verse 12, each one went straight forward. They went wherever the Spirit Uh, wanted to go. This is the uh, Holy Spirit, and he'll be mentioned four more times. Uh, And they did not turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning. And the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning." If, as a Christian, you have the liberty to use artificial intelligence, read this description into one of those artwork apps and see what it comes up with. I'd be curious to see uh, their interpretation of what the cherubim look like. Now, we saw last time that this vision came to Ezekiel on his 30th birthday. That was the day he was going to go into the priesthood and start his ministry as a priest from 30 years old to 50 years old. But he was taken captive five years before that, and though he was born into the priesthood and was destined to be a priest, that was all taken away from him uh, as he just was there, you know, depressed with the other captives in Babylon. God remembered Ezekiel's birthday. I doubt that they were having a birthday party for him. Things weren't that great at this point. But God remembered his birthday, and he came and he says, you'll never be a priest There'll never be a priest, but Ezekiel, I don't need a priest right now. I need a prophet, and you're going to be my prophet to the exiles. Jeremiah was God's prophet to Jerusalem and the people who were left behind. 
but uh, Ezekiel would be the prophet to the exile. And it's a gift, but it would be a, a difficult gift to administrate, as we'll see. We'll see next week in his calling, the Lord lets him know that really no one's going to believe you, uh, but I want you to minister for me anyway. And so Ezekiel received it, and what a ministry he had, a fantastic ministry. And so the Lord, the Lord knows us. He remembers us, you might say, and gives us exactly what we need. Not what we want, maybe not what we're trained for, but exactly what we need that will further the cause of the gospel. Let's take a look at the chariot. The burning question I'm sure we all have is this, what does God need with a starship? Okay, well, see, you never saw Star Trek V, I guess. But anyway, God doesn't need a starship to travel. He doesn't need cherubim to drive him. He doesn't need a prophet. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. But he has created us to have fellowship with him and with one another as members of one another. It's the way of things. It's the way that God created the human race, to have fellowship with him and with one another. And that's why we need to be in a local fellowship of believers that God has raised up. And he, he kind of emphasizes that in the New Testament by telling us that, hey, as a church, you're like a body, like a human body, and you're like a building. Peter says we're like living stones being put together in the Lord's building. And so this morning, each of us is a living stone fitting together so that we make a structure that is pleasing to God. And if you say, well, I don't need that. I can be a Christian at Starbucks uh, and just hang out there. I can watch Pastor Gene or thousands of others, really, on my little device. And, and uh, occasionally, I'll share with somebody and stuff. So that's my church. Well, you're a rock that never gets put in place, right? And so there's a defect in the temple, as it were, and you're over here just being a rocket. Uh, you, you know, you're a living stone that, that doesn't do anything. The uh, body metaphor, Paul says, we're like members of one human body, hands, feet, head, all of this kind of thing. And so if you say, well, no, I'm not a, uh, you know, I'm a member of the larger body of Christ, but I don't need to be a member of the local body. Well, when you, if something on you gets dismembered, you only have a certain amount of time to put it back on, right? And if not, what happens to it? It dies. It gets gangrene, it dies. And so I see these people who say, well, I don't need the body of Christ. I say, you're like a gangrenous death, right? You know? And they, they do. They, be, they begin to affect other people in a, in a negative way uh, because they're not under anyone's authority. They're, they don't really meet with people. Uh, they think they're better than the Lord. Uh, and, and here's the thing. Um, people always say, well, I quit going to, to church, quit going to fellowship because this event happened, this, this situation happened. And, it, you know, somebody in the congregation did something terrible to me or whatever, or the leadership. And you know what? That happens. I'm not here to tell you that doesn't happen. But here's the thing. The Lord says, uh, you know... Put on the things of Jesus Christ. We're to be gentle and peaceful and kind and loving and patient and all this. And I'll tell you right now, when somebody says, I'm not coming to church anymore, anywhere, because the people are weird, well, of course they're weird because they're people. And God says, how about you think of it as a place where you can experiment with whether you're a Christian or not? If you say, I'm not going there anymore, I, you know, I don't have the patience for that. Well, that's exactly why God wants you there to learn patience or to learn how to love or to, to forgive, especially, right? And, and that's the thing. When Christians split off from a body of believers, a local body, they have no way to express Christianity to Christians. They, they, I, how do they know they're growing in the Lord? How do they know they love others? Well, I'll tell you right now, they don't love others because they're not willing to serve others and to, you know, those kinds of things. And so absolutely you're going to have trouble in church. You're probably going to have the most trouble in church because Christians, you think, wow, this person's a Christian and they let me down. Or he's a leader and he let me down. First of all, obviously Jesus will never let you down. And you're in that situation because the Holy Spirit says, hey, let's go. What you need now is kindness. What you need now is love. What you need now 
is patience or forgiveness or grace or whatever it is. What you need now is to be a real Christian and not somebody who's gonna withdraw and you know, let your brothers and sisters either get away with stuff or be killed, in a sense, by the enemy. And so, um, yeah, okay. Every time I come home from church and nothing bad happens, I think, praise the Lord. I mean, you know, what's the potential for this many people? And they're saying weird things. Uh, nobody here has ever done this, but people have said weird things to me before. Now, I've, I've surveyed this group, nobody here, so I can say that. Nobody has to feel bad. People are going to go home and say, he was talking about me. He was looking right at me when he said that. But, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I don't always react the right way either. But, um, hey, this is the Christian life. And so if you're just, you know, you know how much I love Starbucks. Uh, you know, if you're just over at Starbucks having your non-coffee beverage, you know, that's, you know, you like a little bit of coffee on top of cream, uh, and you think you're being a Christian, who are you loving? Who are you forgiving? Who are you serving? Nobody. And so just, I reject that. Verse 15. Now, as I looked at the living creatures, behold, a wheel was on the earth beside each living creature with its four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their workings was like the color of beryl, and all four had the same likeness. The appearance of their workings was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they moved, they went uh, toward any one of four directions. They didn't turn aside when they went. As for their rims, they were so high, they were awesome, and their rims were full of eyes all around the four of them. When the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them, and when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. I don't know if this is what they're talking about, but maybe you've seen the uh, Apple iCar prototype vehicle. I don't think they're going to market it. Uh, but a beautiful car, its wheels look like soccer balls. They're round. They're like round balls. And so the car goes in all kinds of weird directions when you're driving it. And so for parallel parking, you, can, you pull up parallel to the curb and it goes sideways uh, into the curb. It's really cool. Uh, you remember, I used to know how to parallel park. How about you? No, I was good at it, you know, not too many years ago. And um, man, every time I, I say, Pam said, oh, there's a parking place there. I go, no, there's not. Are you, I'm one of those people, you, you get behind those people who take some 18 turns to get into there, you know, and then their wheel is up on the curb and, you know, they're sticking, oh, it's good enough, you know, and stuff. Uh, I mean, I just can't get it. To, I, I suppose if I practiced, uh, I could do it, but I'd rather walk a half a mile than embarrass myself. Um, and then, you know, there's people, and then you, you want to blow your mind, there's people who parallel park on the other side of a one-way street. Poo! Man, I mean, that's just the opposite and then if you throw in a, a European drive uh, with a clutch, I might as well just jump off a cliff. But anyway, I guess it just comes with age. Verse 20, wherever the spirit wanted to go, they went because there the spirit went and the wheels were lifted together uh, with them for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went. When those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up together with them for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. And so the cherubim had control of the wheels, uh, and the spirit of God had control of the cherubim. Verse 22, the likeness of the firmament above the heads of the living creatures was like the color of an awesome crystal stretched out over their heads. So there's a cover above these four cherubim, or a, we could call it a platform. Light shone through it as light through a precious stone, the final verses of this chapter, we're going to take them with chapter 2 because they kind of go together that way. But we'll see that there is a throne above the cherubim on top of this firmament, uh, and it's the throne of God. Each one had two which covered one side, and each one had two which covered the other side of the body. When they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of many waters, like the voice of the Almighty, a tumult like the noise of an army. And when they stood still, they let down their wings. The ark and the mercy seat were removed before Solomon's temple was destroyed. There are many theories as to where it went. Jeremiah may have hidden it before the Babylonians totally destroyed the temple. The Ethiopian church claims that they have it in some ramshackle shed somewhere. Uh, and you know what? It'd be just like God to, to hide out uh, in something like that. But personally, I think it's... It's gone, it's destroyed, it's unnecessary. Uh, you know, there is an ark in heaven, 
obviously, uh, in, in the sense that God sits enthroned on this situation. And uh, the truth is, the ark was never seen again after the first temple was destroyed. I was a Christian for a long time before I realized, oh, after that temple was destroyed, in Zerubbabel's temple, the second temple, in Herod's temple, there was no Shekinah. There was no ark. They put a slab in there and you know, did the blood on that, and did the sacrifice there. Uh, you know, it was, it was kind of weird. In the millennial, or in the tribulation, there'll be a temple. There won't be the presence of God in that temple. But finally, when we get to the millennial kingdom, there'll be a new magnificent temple, brand new, bigger than, or as Trump would say, the biggest temple ever, bigger than anything, uh, anything, you know, yeah, I, you know, he does, I just, you know, it's not a political thing, he's just cute, you know, it's a, it's the greatest temple man has ever seen, no one's ever seen a temple like that, anyway, it's great, it'll be great, and the presence of the Lord will be, and Jesus will be on the earth at the same time, so you'll have all kinds of Shekinah. Uh, in Back to the Future, there's a scene where Marty McFly is worried about whether Doc Brown is going to show up to help him get back to the future, As tension builds, one of the characters reassures Marty, and he says, don't worry, he'll be here. This line underscores their trust and belief that the hero will arrive on time despite the uncertainty. Remember how Ezekiel ends? The Lord will be here. And so uh, this is something that, imagine you're a, a Jew and you're in captivity, you're in an internment camp in Babylon, you're, you, um, Jeremiah has been ministering in, the, in, in Jerusalem saying the, everything's going to be destroyed. And Ezekiel comes along and says, no, that's true. Everything will be destroyed. But in the end, the Lord will be there. There is a temple for us, for our descendants. God hasn't lost us as the apple of his eye. He is working with us. He doesn't, we don't deserve it, but he's going to continue throughout human history to to focus history's attention on the nation of Israel. I mean, if you study history, you think, who cares about the nation of Israel? Uh, And most history books don't have much about Israel, right? Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they've changed that. I doubt it. But God says, no, you, you misunderstand. Israel's the most important nation ever. It's the nation around which everything revolves. It is going to be the key nation and the key city in the future. And this would all come to these poor exiles as the Lord will be there. The Lord will be there. God's people were uh, conquered and held captive, and their trust in the temple would be taken away. Looking back on centuries of intense persecution and suffering, it's easy to conclude that Israel had been abandoned by God. If you didn't know anything from the Bible, you'd think, oh, the Jews, yeah, sure, they're in their land again, and that's pretty weird and mysterious, but... You know, obviously, they've been abandoned by God. Look at how they've been treated. Has God abandoned them? Certainly not. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew, said Paul the Apostle in Romans 11. Meanwhile, the Lord is here. By here, I mean in us as Christians. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit indwells you. You're not a Christian unless the Holy Spirit indwells you. All you need to do, the Bible says, is believe Christ and it will be accounted to righteousness for you. God will justify you, and the Spirit will take, uh, re- uh, he'll live in you. Residence, he'll take residence. I know I could get it if you waited long enough. He will reside in you. And you come to the cross where he died for your sins. Give him your filth and your garbage of your life. He gives you the robe of righteousness. You receive him and are born again, and the Spirit is in you. And that's why Paul the Apostle says, you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit on the earth. And it does, not in the sense, you've heard people talk about, you know, my body is my temple, you know, and they're like posing and stuff like that. I mean, that's okay. If you want to do that, that's fine. I mean, I'm not making fun of it. Uh, no, I, I really am not. But that's not, you know, the thing is, oh, I don't eat sugar because my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I eat a lot of sugar because my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus, I think, would like sugar, you know. But anyway, I, but that's not the thing. The inner man is being renewed day by day, I, and that's, that's what we're getting at. And so he indwells you, and your body is his temple. Uh, and when we gather together, Paul says, now, 
All of us little temples get together and then we become the temple of the Lord in the sense that Jesus manifests himself and is present in our gatherings. And, and so our gathering becomes a temporary temple of the Holy Spirit. And so what a wonderful, marvelous, creative, gracious God we have. And so today you are either the temple of the Holy Spirit in this marvelous temple or you're not. And if you're not, then Jesus Christ died for you. He is the savior of all men, especially those who believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Let's pray.